Imani McKee, welcome to Head on Fire. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I am uh, so honored to get to speak with you, uh, mostly because for folks who don't know you or what it is that you do, tell people a little bit about yourself. I'm Bonnie McKee. I'm best known as a professional songwriter. Um, I've written 10 number one songs for all your favorite pop stars, Britney Spears, <laughs> Katy Perry, uh, Kelly Clarkson, uh, Christina Aguilera, uh, Carly Rae Jepsen, you know, I, I love Adiva. And um, I am also an indie artist and I have been making my own music since I came to Los Angeles. Well, I mean, since I was a child, but um, I've been in LA for about 20 years and um just fighting the good fight in the cutthroat music industry and still standing so you know there are a few people in music who every now and then get called the music industry oh you know ariana grande is is the music industry right now taylor swift is the music industry right now but what i don't think people realize is there's an entire group of people who are much more accurately representative of the phrase, the music industry of a particular period. And that's, of course, songwriters. And your songs have dominated radio for many, many years, racking up multiple international number one singles. So I have to ask you, what's it like being the music industry? Because <laughs> Ms. Bonnie McKee, Ugh. for quite a while, you've been it. Oh, well, I don't know about that. Um, I was lucky <laughs> enough to be kind of in the right place at the right time. There are a lot of really talented writers out there that don't get the opportunities that I've had. Um, so I don't know that there's anything particularly special about me, except that I had I had good timing and I had the right co-writers, you know, like I didn't I didn't write any of these songs by myself. I was in the rooms with, you know, Max Martin and Katy Perry and Dr. Luke and all of these like huge, incredible songwriters and producers um and i mean of course it's going to be a hit when you're in the room with people yeah. of that caliber you know um so for when i had my first hit ever which was california girls um i i had been struggling for years already and it didn't really feel real and i, I really struggled to kind of accept any um praise for it because i felt like it was hmm. cheating i had imposter syndrome and i was just like yeah no i was just like happened to be the other person in the room um, but then, you know, as, as time went on and as the hits kept happening, I finally, I mean, years after was like, okay, I guess maybe I did have a lot to do with that, you know? Um, but it took me, it took me a while to sort of accept that. <laughs> How long did it take you? I mean, a few years, it was just kind of shell shock. Just like, I, it just kept happening and kept, it was just, I had like four number one songs in one summer which is really unheard of and really insane. Um, and it was a huge relief because I had been struggling for so long. Mm -hmm. um, but it was also like kind of bittersweet because I really wanted to be an artist. Like that was really my first love um, and still is. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was hard at first, but then it was really cool to be recognized for my intellectual property um because i think you know as a as a woman in the industry it's like i kind of came up feeling like i had to be cute and do a little dance and have a pretty voice for anyone to care um and so it was cool that my writing was what got me where i am today you know i remember uh getting that first album of yours like stumbling across it in a borders which like <laughs> r.i.p borders it was the superior bookstore yeah. chain <laughs> Uh, I remember coming across Trouble, and I think in the jacket notes of that, you described yourself as like a combination of Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera. And I have always <laughs> described your music and your style that way, but also as though like a mad scientist took one part Britney and one part Christina and then took that resulting child and raised it on like the very best 80s cartoons ever, like like the deep cut <laughs> 80s cartoons like the weirder episodes of Rainbow Bright? Like, so I'm just curious, like, <laughs> what, what were your early influences and how did you come to music? You know, it's funny that you say that because like I, yeah, I grew up on pop music. Um, I loved Madonna and Michael Jackson and Prince and Britney Spears. Um, but that wasn't the kind of music that I made naturally um, mm. because I was mm -hmm. classically trained. I was like a poet, you know? And so I also loved Carole King. Like Carole King was a huge influence on me and Fiona Apple. 
Um, and so, you know, in my head, I was like a Britney Spears, but when I opened my mouth, I sounded like more of a Fiona Apple, like singer songwriter thing. And so there was a big disconnect between me and the label and like what was in my head, who I wanted to be and what was coming out of me. Um, and that really, uh, I think has to do with the producers that I was put in the room with. And also at the time it was like Michelle Branch and, um, Oh, God, what is her name? Oh, Vanessa Carlton. Uh, Vanessa Carlton um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so I think they wanted me to be the girl behind the piano and I wanted to dance yeah. and I wanted to make, you know, write sexy music videos. And so I was, I was very like creatively frustrated because I just, it's, it's hard to get what's in your head out. Uh, if you don't know how to produce, if you don't know, you know, mm -hmm. and so it took me a really long time to finally find the collaborators that were able to, uh, to help me create what I was hearing in my head. You know, I kind of identify that from a writer's perspective. I'm a poet as well and, and uh, transitioning to, you know, I've written, uh, but my debut uh, big five publishing was a nonfiction randomly. Like mm -hmm. it was just this weird mm -hmm. backdoor because you know, you find your way to success in the strangest ways. Sometimes uh, you wanted to be a performer. You ended up being a songwriter. Not that you're not a performer, but that was your sort of inroad into like A-level success. And mine was nonfiction. I never thought it was going to be. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, your 30,000 foot perspective. Now looking back on your career, maybe advice to younger folks starting out about maybe saying yes to opportunity because, um, you know, it is just so interesting how when you start out, both you put yourself into a box and everybody that you meet along the way is also trying to put you in a box. And the longer you let people put you in a box, the more rigid that box becomes. And so yes. in order to say, you know, I I've been in PR and marketing meetings where somebody saw the tagline for my book and, and said, okay, well, we're going to put you in these rooms and on these panels and these discussions and yada, yada. And I'm like, okay, well you can, but that is not going to go well. Also, has anybody here actually read my book? No, okay. <laughs> yeah. maybe do that before telling me how you should market me. So like, yeah. you know, how do you feel about those boxes? How do you feel about like finding your audience and how do you feel about, um, you know, sort of those early labels at the early part of people's careers? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that, you know, from, from a label's perspective, like y you do kind of have to find a lane for your artist. Yeah. Um, I think, I think that things have changed a lot um, with mm -hmm. the, uh, with social media and people and the artists being able to really have a personality and not just whatever um, a label or a, a marketing department puts forward for them. Um, so that, is a huge freedom that I think that um, newer artists today really take for granted. Um, it used to be like, you know, like you couldn't put out music unless you had a record deal. And mm -hmm. if you had a record deal, you didn't really have any control over the narrative of who you are and what you sound like. Um, so it, it is a huge freedom today to be able to do that. Um, but as far as being put in a box, I, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't really know that that was going to be a problem. I was like, okay, like, I, I mean, I was broke. I was really broke when I started um, writing songs for the people and I was just trying to get by. And, um, and I knew I was like getting in, going to get in the room with cool people and I could learn a lot. I wanted to really hone my craft. And, um, but there is definitely a, a stigma that comes with being a songwriter, especially if you have success in the industry where it's like, you are just a songwriter. And that's mm -hmm. something that I have, I'm still fighting to this day. You know, everyone in the industry knows my name and I, mm -hmm. you know, I, my, I have a reputation uh, for my work, but when I walk in the room as an artist, people are like, I mean, I've literally had uh, CEOs of big record companies that I've known for years that I know love me and respect me. Mm -hmm. Be like, I'm like, Hey, so like, this is what I'm going to do. And they're like, Oh, you're still trying to be an artist mm. and i'm like trying like i don't have a choice you yeah. know i wish like yeah. i literally have prayed where i'm just like please god like relieve <laughs> me of this of this desire to be an artist uh not i mean not to be an art but to succeed as an artist you know sure um like i've i've and i tried to quit 
for a while where I was just like, I need to, this is too heartbreaking to keep trying to sell myself to people as an artist. Like maybe I'm just delusional. Maybe I'm just barking up the wrong tree and I need to just be happy with what the universe has given me, which is a beautiful life and getting to create songs and, and create, collaborate with other artists and let them have their vision. Um, and so I tried for a few years to sort of like damp it down and be like, okay, just do what's right in front of you and be grateful. <laughs> um, and I was just very unhappy. I was very unhappy. And so I finally was like, you know what, I'm just, I took a look at my life and was like, what really makes me happy? When am I happiest? And I'm happiest when I'm performing, when I'm in front of the camera, um, when I'm on set making music videos, doing movies. I made a movie in the pandemic mm -hmm. um, that randomly like won a bunch of awards. Um, and so, you know, I like to, I do more than write songs and I love writing songs, but there's a lot more to me. And so, you know, the past few years, like where have I been? Like I've been kind of figuring out what my other skills are and putting those to the test. So, you know, you rose to prominence during a period of time when uh, that, that we are currently kind of renegotiating our relationship and understanding with that period, you know, trouble came out in 2004. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, your, your, period of like, you know, big number one hits was uh, somewhere around like 2009, 2010 through about 2013, 2014 or so. Um, mm -hmm. So during that like 10 year period, uh, there's a lot of songs that you ended up writing for people whose public relationships were now kind of renegotiating. Britney Spears being one of them, Kelly Clarkson, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Katy Perry, you know, just a lot of people that late night comedians, the populace at large, really did really dirty. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering, because there's another side to, well, gosh, you know, my success found me in a different way than I expected. Do you ever look back on that period and think, well, if I had made it behind the microphone at the time I wanted to make it behind the microphone, gosh, I wonder, did I maybe do dodge a bullet by not being as big as the people whose hits I was making? Like, do you ever think about that? All the time. Yeah. And like, if my first album had worked, yeah, uh, I, w I might be dead, honestly, because I, uh, I'm a recovering addict, I'm a recovering alcoholic. And um, I was really in the throes of that. And I think I also was just young and naive and cocky and like ego driven. And I think that had I gotten everything I wanted and not fallen flat on my face, I would not be, have been humbled. I would not have learned a lot of really important life lessons that I needed to learn. And I, I probably would have killed myself with drugs and drinking. Um, but also I think it made me a better artist. You know, because I got a, I got a huge record deal when I was 16, 17, yeah. um, like moved to L.A. by myself, had all of this money in my pocket, had my own apartment when all of my peers were like still in high school. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's kissing my ass. I'm an industry darling. And like, I just I thought I made it. <laughs> Little mm -hmm. did I know getting a record deal is really the first of many, many, many steps. And all of the stars have to align. Um, and so I think it was important for me to be humbled and fall on my face and also like have a very real experience of like having it all, losing it all, having it all again, losing it all again. Like that's a big part of my story is like perseverance. And so I think that it's made me a better artist for that. You know, you've talked a lot about, uh, you, you talk a lot about pop music, you write pop music, um, Pop music in general has always gotten a pretty bad rap. Uh, a lot of people like to poo-poo on pop music, uh, especially from like the late 90s and uh, to today. To be fair, almost everything that is generally seen as being marketed to primarily young women isn't treated with a lot of respect. Um, but pop mm -hmm. music specifically is seen as like vapid, having very little to say, as being about nothing. Now, I am a very gay millennial of a very certain age. Uh, so I disagree with that because most of my blood type is made up of pop music and pop divas. But, <laughs> so I very much disagree. 
but what do you think those types of critics are missing from pop music? What 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 do you think that the folks who'd like, oh, I don't like that an entire genre of music, this multi-billion dollar industry, I don't like any of that. That has nothing for me. What do you think people are missing? I mean, there? I think it's really silly because, and I, I do think that, that the opinion has changed on that um, in the past mm-hmm. decade or so. It used to be very much, and even when I was like, when I was in middle school or whatever, it was like, you were either into pop or you were into rock or you were into hip hop. And it's like, you had to pick Mm -hmm. a lane. And I feel like now with playlisting and stuff, like you can really love all genres. And I feel like Mm -hmm. it's kind of like uncool not to. (laughs) Um, And I I think that people uh, miss hear pop music as like, if something is just like fun and boppy and upbeat, that it's not saying anything. And some pop music doesn't say anything and that's okay. And we all need an escape, you know? I mean, it's the same thing as like, you know, watching a stupid comedy or whatever. It's sure. like, okay, like maybe we're not like learning big life lessons, but like we want to escape. But mm-hmm. in my own writing anyway, I always try to have an underlying message. Mm-hmm. Um, like everything that I write, even if it sounds like the dumbest little bop is, it comes from a real place. You know, um, whether it's from me or it's from the artist that I'm working with, um, I try to really always have a a root of something real. Um, And I know I've definitely had moments where I've heard a song that I've known for years. Like I had a moment I remember once where I was I was driving the car. I was going through like I I was in a messy relationship and um, Hot and Cold came on. Katy Perry's Hot and Cold came on, yeah. which I always just had like uh, objectively been like, oh, this is a great pop song, like opposites, up, down, left, right, mm-hmm. hot, cold. And then, but I was dealing with someone that was kind of like wishy washy, and I was like, it just hit me. Like one oh, yeah. day it just hit me, and I was like, yeah. oh my God, you are, you're hot, you're cold, you're up, you're down. And I was like, oh my God, like this, this is, there's a message here. But it like took me a couple of years of listening to it, to, and I just had to be in the right place for it to hit me. And I had a similar experience um, with uh, Love is a Battlefield. I remember I was like, oh, sure. Long, yeah. long time ago. I was like, I was out at the club. I was drunk. I was high. I was like, you know, going through it, like crying on the dance floor. Like that song came on. And I was like, I'm hearing this song for the first time. Mm-hmm. And like, I feel like, you know, if it's, if a pop songwriter is smart, <laughs> you'll, you'll find something that can really resonate with someone. Um, and there is lots of rapid pop music out there. Sure. Sure. But, who doesn't pop, love it? But pop, <laughs> yeah, but but also pop music as a craft is one of the most difficult genres to write because it is a moving target. Um, like country music is is genius in its storytelling, mm-hmm. and there are a million different ways to spin it. I love how they do it in Nashville. Um, but but musically, for the most part, there is a very specific thing genre there. There's a very specific sound that. Um, and I've written in Nashville and they're always like, you're too pop. Like this is, this isn't a country song. And I'm like, okay. So, so Get like Carrie Underwood certain, on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> there's a certain formula for that genre that everyone follows. Uh-huh. And when it comes to pop, like it really is so broad and it's mm-hmm. constantly changing and evolving. And I think that's, what's so exciting about it. Um, because pop is short for popular, mm-hmm. you know, um, like the goal is to reach the masses and to write a song that can relate to your grandma and your little cousin and your boyfriend or girl, whatever, it's it's not easy to reach the masses. And so that's what I really love about the challenge of writing pop music. You know, I think you bring up a really important point. I think that it is, it's one of those genres that I think is undervalued because people simply do not listen to the lyrics and they don't appreciate that those lyrics came from a real person and from a real place. Um, It's sort of like, you know, I always think of that uh, kind of iconic moment in Kelly Clarkson's career where piece by piece came out and then she did it just with, just with that piano on American Idol. And then she like Mm -hmm. sobbed Mm -hmm. through it. And then suddenly people Mm -hmm. were like, Oh, that's what that song was about. Whoops. Uh Yeah, we yeah we missed that one. Or uh, uh-huh. like the, uh, when when Pumped Up Kicks was the big song all over the country, and everybody yeah. was just kind of like bopping along to Pumped Up Kicks, and then then folks realized, oh wait, this yeah. this song, yikes, heavy, heavy, yeah. yeah. No, I love a hidden message in a pop song. I really yeah. do, and I always try to sneak something in there. You know, <laughs> what's what's something you've snuck into a pop song that you don't think people have caught yet? Well, I think I think 
most people caught it um but like in in american girl in my own song mm-hmm. uh i think i think first listen it's like oh america mm-hmm. like it's a satirical song sure. <laughs> um it's you know and it's really about the experience of what it's like to be a, a girl in america mm-hmm. and kind of the attitude of, of being an american which is like complicated and fun and privileged but also like can get weird you know um and the expectations and all of that and so i think that is kind of like people think that that is like a yay america song but it's not <laughs> and also i i think probably the biggest example of my hidden stuff is uh the chorus on dynamite tayo cruz is dynamite um not mm-hmm. bts is dynamite uh <laughs> uh and that I throw my hands up in the air sometimes saying, hey, oh, baby, let's go. And people always ask me, like, oh, why is it, why do you throw your hands up in the air? Why do you throw your hands up in the air only sometimes? And I'm like, well, it's like, it's it's not actually a party song for me. It, I, I wrote that song when I was um, just getting sober. And it's about mm-hmm. surrender. And it's about letting go. Um, so it's like, sometimes you throw your hands up in the air and just say, gotta let it go. You know, it's not like, yeah, we're going to rock sometimes, you know? <laughs> um, so I think mean, it's just funny, like seeing the, the way that that song was received. I mean, I knew I wanted it to be received as a party song, obviously, but um, people just don't always realize where these songs come from. It's interesting the themes that we revisit in, in our writing uh, as you're re-describing American Girl to me. It reminds me of that the song from your first album, Just a Girl. I'm just a girl. Oh, my gender. It's yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, the, yeah. Confessions, confessions of a teenage girl. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, songwriting is, is coming under a lot of scrutiny in recent years. I know Diane Warren got into kind of some hot water last year with, uh, with, I guess what she thought was going to be a pretty chill take on, uh, Beyonce's latest album and saying, Oh, why does a song have so many writers these days? Back in my day, we just had one songwriter, yeah, you you've worked on a number of songs that ended up having multiple credited writers. So that a lot of what this show does is talk to people in in fields where folks feel like they kind of already know everything about a field. And I feel like songwriting is one of those. So you've worked on some songs where you're the only song credited songwriter, and you've worked on songs where you're one of a pretty large group. Mm-hmm. How, what does the general public not understand about how and why so many people get credited for writing songs? Well, first of all, Diane Warren is a special breed of songwriter. She's a hundred percenter. She writes everything herself, oh. always. She doesn't, yeah. as far as I know, I don't think she co-writes at all. Um, and that, and that's incredible. And like, we don't all have that uh, kind of luxury where people will trust us to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but in pop music, it really takes a village. Um, there is, there are producers. Oftentimes, there's more than one producer. There's a team of producers. It's incredibly tedious that writing, creating a pop song, making the track is like hours and hours and hours to polish something. And it's nice to have someone to collaborate with, first of all, just on the production side to have another brain. Um, and then when it comes to the top line, which is the melody and lyric, um, it's also nice to have someone to ping pong with and share your ideas with. And if you have an artist um, who is extremely busy touring the world and doing all this stuff like they don't necessarily have the time to sit down and craft something all by themselves some of them do and they're and that doesn't mean they're not capable but it's just like why not phone a friend (laughs) you know um and when it comes to the beyonce stuff there's a lot of samples on that and so um when you have a sample in a song you're that means that everyone that worked on that original song is going to be credited Mm -hmm. plus all of the new people that you've brought on um so it, it really does take a village um and you know there are plenty of artists where it's it's just a producer and a writer um but for the most part it takes a whole team of people to make something happen and it's it's more fun that way i mean the more people you get on a track the less percentage you get um Mm -hmm. and so you know that's another thing that people are like oh like you know you have you get a hit and then you're rich like (laughs) like that 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 pie is divided so many ways not just you know if you have a publishing deal then they take a piece of it if you have a manager if you have an agent you know whatever it is um that people everyone gets a piece <laughs> yeah i i think that's that's kind of a that's kind of a thing that i think a lot of people uh, mo- most people that are not in creative fields um 
think that once you once you get that publishing deal once once one song hits once you get one book published once you get oh you're rich now because that's what yeah, you know no. you, uh-huh. you, you <laughs> Carrie Bradshaw in Sex and the City is is getting like what like a dollar 50 a word to write for something and in yeah. reality it's like three cents maybe or something yeah. like that like you know the reality yeah. never matches up with uh with how media mm-hmm. talks about us <laughs> Uh, you have straddled both sides of the singer songwriter career for a long time now. Uh, what's better? What do you prefer? Do you want to be behind the microphone? Do you like, you know, is, is one of them more comfy for you at, at some stage or the other? Have you always floated between? I like being able to mix it up. Um, Mm -hmm. I think probably being, being a songwriter is a lot of work, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's a more, it's a more chill life. I'd say, I mean, depending on how, wh- how much of a workaholic you are, there were definitely years and years where I was doing double sessions every day and working mm-hmm. seven days a week, you know, day sessions, night sessions, working till three, four in the morning. Um, and that is exhausting and also like not rewarding because as a songwriter, you don't get paid for your time. Uh, everything you do is on spec, mm-hmm. uh, which means that you write for free. <laughs> um, nobody buys your lunch nobody pays for your uber uh you just show up and give and give and give and um if you're lucky you might win the lottery and have a hit and i mean it's an insane stupid business model because it's like gambling it's just like okay well and and so then you're just like working yourself to death because it's like today might be the day like maybe i'll write the hit today and it's um it's a it's a it's pretty draining honestly Um, and then, but on the other hand, being an artist, uh, a, you get to, you don't have, well, it it depends on if you're signed or not, but as an indie artist, I don't have to answer to anyone. Um, I don't have, uh, there's not really a, what's the word I'm looking for? A compromise. There's not a compromise with the artists, you know, because sometimes when you write with an artist, like the artist has a vision, I'm trying to help them fulfill that, but maybe I don't agree with what they're trying to say, or maybe I, whatever. But I'm, I'm in the service industry, essentially, as a songwriter. I'm there to serve the artist. Um, and when you're the artist, you get to say what you want. You get It sounds how you want. The videos look how you want. Um, and so it's nice to have that freedom. And also, um, as an indie artist anyway, I, I own my master's. And that is extremely valuable. So um, I personally, you know, I had a crazy run with, with the songwriting for other people. And... Um, I own a house, you know, like that was, that was very uh, lucrative for me. Um, but it doesn't last forever. You know, you mm-hmm. have a run and then like, I may not ever have a hit for someone else again. I, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I'm, I'm done like chasing it. Like if mm-hmm. it, I will collaborate with the right people if it feels right. And if it's fun, uh, but I, I'm not trying to keep, chase that dragon <laughs> anymore. Um, I, because as an artist, if I make something, I know it's coming out. I know I'm going to put it out. I know I'm going to get, you know, the master side, the publishing side, and I can get syncs. I can, you know, I can perform, I can sell merch. Um, It is expensive being an indie artist, but uh, at least I know that the work and and my heart and soul and blood, sweat and tears is going to see the light of day. Whereas when you're putting all of that work into someone else, there's no guarantee it'll come out. And I'm not even paid for my time. So it's like, why? What's the you point? <laughs> share a quality with Taylor Swift in that because you're the writer, you uh, you had this fun little album uh, that was supposed to come out a while back. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there was all of this mess with the masters and who owns it and your label crushed it. And you really wanted to put it out. And you had a lot of fans high that really wanted <laughs> that album. And you slowly, methodically... Uh, pulled a Taylor Swift and you were like, Hey, I'm just going to re-record all of this mm-hmm. and put it out. Yeah. And you're starting to do that. What one, how, how did you finally just decide to like give into that piece and like, you know what, I'm just going to own it myself and do it all myself. Was that scary? Was that, was that, what was that feeling like? Um, yes, it was scary. It was scary. Um, I mean, I, it was a long process of trying to negotiate with the label and uh, emails and digging up old legal documents and all these things. Uh, and I finally was like, I- I'm, I've waited long enough. I 
have a studio in my house. I know how to record these things. Uh, I know I'm a really good mimic. I'm, I'm, I can recreate my own voice again. And there were things also that I, I thought could improve. Um, so I just went ahead and did it because I was tired of being held back. I mean, and it's been so freeing oh, to, to hear Slay, to be able to just like, and, and to have other people hear it, most importantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, demos leaked and that honestly sucked. Um, like I appreciate the fans' enthusiasm, um, but it really complicates things for me when the demos mm -hmm. leak. Um, but I, I mean, honestly, the demos leaking, I guess, was what led me back to, I don't know, I think if the demos hadn't leaked that I probably would have put it out a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but because the demos leaked, I felt like uh, the the mystique was gone, and the, and I was like, no, nobody's gonna care. They've already heard it. There's already access to it. There's no element of surprise. It's like stealing my thunder. It's like blowing out my birthday cake candles. You know, when I don't get to do it. Um, but you know, I think ultimately the the fans having these these bootleg versions and and also the live recordings of when I toured these songs uh, mm -hmm. is what led to me being inspired to do it because 10 years later people still wanted to hear them and that was really encouraging and honestly like once i got on tiktok because I, I i really refused to get on tiktok for a long time i was like this is not for me i don't get it and then when i finally surrendered to the tiktok gods and got on the app i was like <laughs> oh this is this is where everybody is yeah so i had been on instagram and i had been like i'm just plateaued like no I, nobody cares i'm like i'm yeah. still making cool content nobody cares and then I got on TikTok and everyone's like, we love you. There you are. And I was like, oh, I've been, I've missed you. And so having, you know, and so I listened to the fans and I asked them, you know, which, which songs do you want to hear? And so some of them, um, I was not able yes. to record. They just said, it, yes, just all of it, whatever, anything you just have, whatever <laughs> you just want to pull out the sofa cushions, whatever songs you can find in there, just, all of it. just give it to me. Yes. Um, so I, yeah, I was pleasantly surprised that everybody knew the lyrics and there were people that got tattoos of, of the lyrics and stuff. And so that was really encouraging and inspiring for me. And honestly, I really am releasing this album from 10 years ago for the fans. This is really, especially for the fans, um, because the fans and the forums that I've seen and the comments and everything over the past 10 years is what has kept me going where I'm like, you know, I may not be a gigantic fan base, but there's a handful of people out there that really care about what I'm doing. And that means a lot to me. And that kept me going. Like I really, this is a love letter to my fans for sure. What are you most excited about coming out? Mm. I mean, I want, oh, gosh, in re-recording these songs, I kind of like my favorite one kind of keeps switching mm. <laughs> um, because like, I've gotten to revamp them. And these, these like, this like demo whitus I had for a long time where I was like, eh, is this that great? I don't know. I got to revamp them and I'm like, wow, this, there's something real here. Because I remember I wrote these songs like at the pinnacle of my pop so songwriting success. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was really on my A game and I, I always felt like there was really something here. Um, and so I don't know, it keeps changing. I'm excited for Hot City. Uh, I'm excited for Don't Get Mega Famous. Um, everything But You has really turned into an epic, uh, heart wrenching love bop it's still very up tempo but um i don't know i think i think y'all are gonna love it i'm really excited i'm really really proud of it um so i don't know the, the whole project i mean also something that has been so hard for me is like looking at my my spotify and apple music and being like like the 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 low amount of songs that i have released like when i've written thousands of songs i'm sitting on all of these incredible songs and to be like, wow, there's only one full length album on here and it's from 2004. Mm -hmm. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> what is wrong with me? Like, why did this happen? And so it's been also a very like reflective time for me looking back at this and being like, what have I been waiting for? And I realized that like, I've really just been waiting for permission. Like I keep mm -hmm. waiting for someone to be like, okay, you can be an artist now. Okay, it's your time. And I finally, and, and honestly like, I feel like the fans really did that for me where I was like, okay, you want it, you got it. And I'm just like, I just wish I hadn't waited so long, but I think also it's a timing thing. It's like the fact that these songs still 
slap all this time later, I'm like, okay, so these prove to be kind of evergreen. They don't sound dated. They don't sound mm -hmm. like they're from 2013, other than the fact that it's sparkly maximalist pop music. But it's like, Which they are is timeless. evergreen. Who doesn't <laughs> I mean, love I think sparkly so. maximalist pop music? I mean, I guess a lot of a lot of newer music fans don't really know the joy. They are incorrect. Pop music. They are incorrect. <laughs> they just have, they haven't the experienced key. it yet. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, you know, at, at your level of creativity, how do you deal with jealousy? Uh, I, you know, I was. Um, I mean, I know that a lot of I'm, I'm I come at this from an author's perspective, and you know, there's 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 this weird feeling that there's only so much room at a table somehow, and it's like I, I don't that's just not that's so not remotely true. Um, the table doesn't exist, especially today. How you were talking about earlier that there's there is just infinite audience out there, especially because of social media, especially because you can kind of own your own creativity, which, oh my gosh, you like, I, I, I want to ask you about your music videos and how you uh, kind of claimed ownership over, you know, that particular aesthetic, but how do you deal, how do you deal with jealousy in, in that field, in such a big field? Um, I mean, you know, it's, it depends on the table that you're sitting at, you know, <laughs> uh like is there room at the table there's not there's not room there's not very much room at the table on radio i can tell you that there's only 10 15 songs on rotation in pop radio at a time mm -hmm. in america it's different when you go to the uk and stuff when, when you turn on pop radio there it's like i mean you won't hear the same song twice in a day maybe you'll hear it twice but you won't hear it 10 times in a row i don't listen to the radio anymore because yeah, I'm like, I, I can't think of the last time I turned a radio on. <laughs> like in in one commute, in yeah. one like half hour commute, I'll hear the same song twice. I'm just yeah. like, for real, like what the yeah. fuck? It's just like boring. And I think also now that like everyone can choose their own adventure with mm -hmm. with streaming, like why would you like, why would you wait to be told what to listen to when you can like pick it yourself? But um, but what? So like radio aside there's plenty of room at the table and i think i don't know I, jealousy is kind of like a a long ago issue for me personally because i really like to see other people win especially mm -hmm. people that i know <laughs> and like it used to be i think like when you're in your early 20s and everyone's like you know racing to be the next starlet it's like yeah it's it's cutthroat and catty um but it my at this stage in my career i'm just like i love helping younger up-and-coming artists i love seeing my peers that have been around for a minute doing their thing because in la specifically like everyone's always like oh everyone's like so fake nice and it's like no like it's like you know if you have a lot of friends if your friends win then you're winning too like it's really about like scratching each other's backs and like helping each other out and also like knowing the struggle like seeing someone succeed, I'm just like, it gives me hope where I'm just like, okay, it can be done. And so I just like, I just try to build people up as much as I can and, and be supportive. Like there's absolutely no point in cutting each other down because you never know 100%. who's going to pop off. And like, you, you're not, you don't need to make any enemies people, on your way up. People that opened doors for me a few years ago, it's now getting to be my turn to help you know, open a door. Now, now I'm at a certain level and I'm able to help introduce them to people that now I'm in the room yeah. with. And then one day it's going to be their turn and, and they're going to loop me back in. And great. Yeah. Like, you pay know, it forward. You pay it yes, forward. Constantly. It's, and I think it's, it's a beautiful thing. And like, I love to collaborate and I love to mentor as well. I feel like because I've had such a rocky road in this industry, uh, I have a lot of wisdom. And so I, I, tend to advise a lot of um, especially young female artists well i mean really kind of all across the board um just like what to and what not to do and what to look out for uh, because i am a bit of a cautionary tale <laughs> when it comes to industry stuff um so i just want to i don't want to see somebody else go through the shit that i went through and i do think that the industry has changed a lot where it's not as predatory as it was when i came in um so that's a good thing um but you know there's still snakes in the grass so 
<laughs> always, always. Um, I do. Uh, so I mentioned uh, just a few seconds ago, uh, your music videos. You have such a unique point of view whenever you're making a music yeah. video, and you, like you, you really own the entire process. Like literally, like you are. I <laughs> watched your TikToks. You are out there cutting cardboard and spray painting stuff mm-hmm. and turning yourself into like. You know, Shira meets Conan meets. It's fantastic. Where, where does that piece come from? Like, how? First of all, how do you have the time? When do you sleep, Bonnie McKee? But like, I don't. Is that fun? <laughs> <laughs> is this is this fun for you? Do you get to play? Is that? It? Do you do you love exploring that side of yourself? I do. I am a craft nerd, and I always have been since I was a little girl. I, I've always made my own Halloween costumes and I loved like redecorating my bedroom when I was a kid and rearranging furniture. Like I'm very much uh, affected by my environment and I, I love like tactical art. Like I love working with my hands and um, I'm a very visual artist, which is I think another reason why I was, I was not as happy being just a songwriter because I didn't have any say in, in the visuals. And that's a huge part of who I am and how I express myself. Um, so I, and I also love video as an art form, which is why I think I've loved TikTok so much because you get to like make little mini movies and I love to edit. I just, there's something really satisfying about like putting together pictures and telling a story. Um, and you know, I kind of, I've always had a hand in, in directing my music videos, even when I was younger, but I never like took the credit for it because I didn't really understand that what I was doing was directing. Um, and so now that I'm a grown ass woman, I understand like what it means to direct and, and I mean, it's hard work, but when it comes to building the sets and stuff, I really love set design. Like I love props. I love, uh, building a world. And so I'm very hands-on on in that respect, but I don't sleep the sleigh video that I made a year ago. Uh, and that just came out just about killed me. You made I that mean, a year I, ago? Yeah, How do you sit I on it thought, that long? Because I thought that I had worked out all of my legal issues with the label, oh, okay. with the masters. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And, and it turned out I hadn't, so I had to re-record everything. So. <laughs> Fun times. <laughs> <It's fine>. Fun <laughs> times. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I made, at the end of the video, there's a, I really wanted to do um, an infinity screen. Like I love infinity effect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I built, I built an infinity mirror for the vault. Um, uh-huh. the album is from the vault because it's from 10 years ago. And so I built uh-huh. an actual physical vault. I figured out how to do a two way mirror. So you get the infinity effect. Um, I built a mirror box so that I could have infinity mirror reflections. Cause that's always fun. And I built infinity screen. Uh, I built two nine foot, uh, projection screens in my backyard and got projectors and had to work out all the math of how to make it fit on the screen and how to light it from the back and then also light myself without diluting the uh, projection. Uh, working with projections is really annoying, um, but I've, and I've learned the hard way <laughs> through trial and error, um, but it's just so satisfying to, and also I'm just impatient. I'm impatient where I'm like, I have this idea. I want to make it happen. I don't want to wait for someone else. I want to find the right person. I just want to make it. And so yeah. I go to Home Depot and I buy the wood and I get a hammer and I go like, and I like go on YouTube and I'm like, what's the best, what's the best rear projection screen? And I'm like doing all this research. And then I go to, went to a theater fabric company and like bought a giant roll of like projection fabric. And like, I'm really interested in the whole process. I love building the actual sets. And I'm a big fan of like eighties, horror and sci-fi and I love all the practical effects and optical mm-hmm. illusions. Um, I, that's really exciting to me. Like green screen is also very exciting and you can do so much more and it's, it's very, you know, uh, it's cheaper and it's faster in a lot of ways. Um, but I just, I love building actual sets and having the uh, practical effects. I love it. <laughs> What's better, a good melody or good lyrics? Ooh, um, really tough to say. I used to really be all about lyrics. And then honestly, after working with Max Martin, he really taught me the importance of melody. And he always said melody is king. 
but I think that you can have a great melody and a stupid lyric and it'll still be good. But mm -hmm. if you have a great melody and a great lyric, then you, you can have an evergreen song. So I think that the lyric makes a difference between a good song and a great song. Um, but also, you know, when you write a song, it's nice, it's nice to write a song that everyone can enjoy, whether they speak your language or not, which is where melody comes in. And so I think melody is, is really important if you want to reach the masses. I think melody is more important. Um, but if you can get that hook together and then also throw in a really thoughtful lyric, then that really moves people. You've, so, you've I, doing, I mean, I, I'd say they're kind of equal, but. You've been doing really well on social media uh, since you, you know, kind of threw yourself into it. Virality can come with the kind of attention that gets folks back into conversations with labels and, and uh, you know, big wigs and stuff. So you put your new album out, it goes viral, the labels start calling again. Would you would you go back? Would you go back to the machine or would you would you stay indie? Um, I think, you know, I would love to do like an imprint deal, which is where mm. I could have my own like sub label under a bigger label because then I could Very Madonna move. creative control. <laughs> yeah, I could I could keep my creative control and I could um but I could have the funding of a major. Um the hardest part about being indie and I, I'm really fortunate that I have my own money from all of the stuff that I did before. But I mean, all of my money goes into my art. Like I, sure. I don't live a super lavish life. Like all I care about is making art. Um, like that is, you know, some people want to go on a lavish vacation. Like I want to make a music video and make a movie. <laughs> like that's what, that's my joy. That's my happy place. Um, so to have help with the funding would be amazing. Um, but as far as like, you know, the machine, like, I don't know, I've kind of just given up on trying to be on the radio. And that's like, really, the main thing that being involved with in, with a major offers. Um, and I guess touring support and everything. I don't know, I think I, I think I like the fight. But it would be nice to have some help with funding. And, and I think that at this point, I have enough experience, uh, and insight that I could run my own label. So that's definitely in the cards for me eventually. Um, just all these gatekeepers got to catch up with me <laughs> you know speaking of uh, you know running your own label who's who's exciting you right now in music um let's see i've been working with tessa violet who i love so mm -hmm. much uh mm -hmm. she's an incredible songwriter and just a really fun collaborator mm -hmm. um peach prc is incredible mm -hmm. um cobra man big fan of cobra man um i'm trying to think kid sister I don't know if you're familiar with Good Sister. They're like kind of like baby Heim a little bit. Oh, um, I love that. They're, yeah, they're they're incredible. They're really fun. They're really cute, and they're like real musicians. Um, play all, all their in instruments and just incredibly talented. I just have really enjoyed meeting this new like crop of like the new up and coming artists. Uh, it's really inspiring and fun, and like their perspective is so different. It's also funny to. To, to work with an artist that was like i grew up listening to your music and they're not thinking about like my 2004 they're like being born in 2004 they're just like wow i, I remember in kindergarten listening to california girls and i'm like wow you know oh, man. <laughs> it's wild <laughs> um have... but it's, it's cool though i really enjoy it <laughs> what's your go-to karaoke song uh probably since you've been gone <laughs> Love it. Uh, well, now I need Since to hear you that. Bring well, the house Bonnie down. McKee, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you have a very busy schedule and I am so appreciative of the time that you took. Uh, for folks um, who want to get a little bit more of you, tell people how they can find you online and uh, what music you have coming out. Okay. Uh, well, you can find me on all the social platforms. <laughs> it's just at Bonnie McKee, just my name. Keep it simple. And, uh, my new single slay is out now you can check out the music video uh follow me on tiktok that's where a lot of the action happens and um i read every comment and i i love hearing from you guys so come say hi thank you so much for being here